A savory meatloaf is one dish you can be sure will please most everyone around your table. Cajun Country Meatloaf is the spicy highlight of today's menu. Light and luscious cucumbers and radishes with yogurt dip, a savory baked onion soup casserole, and Heath Bar cheesecake are other featured attractions in this episode of Natalie Dupree Cooks. talk to you for just a second about onion slicing and keeping before I show you my baked onion soup casserole. Just look at this. This is uh, eight cups of onions and when all is said and done and it's cooked down, it's cooked down by over half. It's about a quart that's left. Four cups that's left. So you can see that there's a considerable difference um, in, in the way that they cook down. Now, when you want to get an onion cooked and brown, I think it's easier to just put it in a couple layers up of two large saucepans and then let them brown slowly rather than putting them all in one pan and letting them cook down to their soft and brown. What you want from this onion soup is a lovely brown onion with a lot of flavor to it because that's what's going to make you feel satisfied. That onion, you want that onion to caramelize. You want the sugar in the onion to come out and caramelize and cook. Now, onions should be stored in a container that where air goes through it, so that it, where air circulates. Uh, and they really shouldn't be stored in the refrigerator because that changes the sugar nature of the onion. But if you're in a hurry, you can certainly slice them all at one time and throw them in the refrigerator. Life might not be perfect for you, as it isn't for a lot of people. And I find if you slice onions once or twice a week, that's enough. So um, I try to do it all at one time if I can. And I also cook a lot of my onions at one time and then leave them in the refrigerator. So then I go back three, four days later and pull them out and use them in something else. And if I see I'm not going to use them, I pop them in the freezer. It'll take you about 25 minutes to get these onions slowly cooking to the way that I want them to. And after they've been cooking about 15 minutes, which these have not been, then you add some garlic. Then when they're completely done, you're going to add some sugar, which is optional, but they may need it. Hello, that's been sitting out there a little while. How about that? And some soy sauce. If I'd been smart, I would have mixed that uh, soy sauce with that sugar. Then season them with lots of black pepper. And you may also refrigerate the onions at this point, you know, up to four or five days. Now, in the meantime, while all this is cooking, go up and cut your French bread. Now, this is my first mistake. First mistake I ever made in a recipe. If you believe that, you'll believe anything. It's so hard to write a recipe. When I made this bread, it was the first time was when I was sick and when I was tired and I was feeling whiny and I wanted something that had bad head cold and I wanted something that made me feel better, made me feel comforted. And I didn't really want all soup, but I wanted that, when you go to France, you can get a really soggy bre French bread soup where they put the French bread in the middle, in, the, in first, and then they put the soup on top and then the cheese on gratiné on top of that. Well, I kind of wanted that, but I didn't want as soupy as a soup. So I made this casserole up, and I liked it, and I still like it, but I had a bread in mind. Now, the bread that I had in mind was this one. Now, this is the bread that we bought today. No recipe is exact, but if you're going to use a piece of bread this long, use half of it in one inch slices. Um, and if you wanted to switch breads, use three-fourths of this. I don't know. I wish I was perfect. I wish somebody that wrote recipes was perfect. I find it a very inexacting science. And you have to use some intelligence when you're looking at this and see what you want. Bread is, will absorb the liquid that it's put into as it sits there. 
so you need to be you need to see how long how long you're going to leave it before you eat it will also determine uh, how many slices of bread you're going to put it in there if you're going to make this ahead put it in the refrigerator and reheat it if you put a whole lot of bread in there it's just going to slurp up all those juices if you don't if you don't put too much bread in it then you'll have more liquid in there might be more than what you want put your bread in a 300 degree oven and bake it about 15 minutes till it's lightly crisp and that's done so it won't absorb too much of the juices but it'll be soft now go ahead and put your bread when it's cooked into and you can do that ahead of time it's called a croute by the way with a quarter inch layer of the cooked onions so here is this mixture I really like this recipe and I want you to like it so much too and put in some grated cheese first quarter inch layer of the grated cheese first now this isn't the kind of layer where you cram in one extra piece of bread uh, this is a country dish and it's supposed to be done lightly and save some parmesan until layer so you layer this up here it's grated swiss and parmesan whatever you think sounds good in fact i have even done it uh, with mozzarella now save some cheese for later and just go ahead and layer these up in the pan as many of them as you want to um, then i'm going to go ahead and add some of the stock when i'm through but i'll add maybe just a little bit more here but not much more than that. Um, a little more onions, a little more cheese to make my approximate half a loaf. And I want to get all these onions in there. Now, add your stock. And we're going to pat some, the remaining cheese. Now, this can be a brown stock. or it can be a white stock. Fill the casserole, not much more than two thirds full. Now I'm gonna have to add a little more of this, but I'm really reluctant. A large part of this has to do with the size of this casserole. And then you just pat your cheese, some more cheese, right on top of this whole thing. Oop. Whisk together your tomato puree, your tomato paste, and the chicken stock, and I should have done that first. This is just to give it a little flavor. Let me get my whisk over here. You didn't want to have it be two, more than two-thirds full because it's going to swell up. If you get too much bread in there, then you're going to put too much stock in there. It's going to do it. Now, you heat all this up just because if it's hot, it, does, it absorbs differently. And ladle it into the pot. And then it should be about halfway up that bread. That's about right. Now, just stick that casserole in the oven at 400 degrees for an hour to an hour and a quarter. 300 degrees will just make it nice and melty and gooey and soft. But check it every 20 minutes or so because you don't want every little last smidgen of that to evaporate. And if you need to add more of this mixture, you can. I think you're gonna think it's just wonderful. And if you have a head cold, you're gonna just love it. Do you know about the Mooley grater? This is the easiest way to grate a small amount of cheese if you don't wanna use a food processor. Just put your cheese in there. You have to get this centered. And just do this. We use them all the time at the London Cordon Bleu, and I, I still find them one of the handiest gadgets to have around the house. And I'm going to turn off all these onions so people don't start waving at me and making signs saying, turn off onions. And let's do the Heath Bar Cheesecake. This will make one nine-inch cheesecake. And cheesecakes are so easy and so fast that it's no wonder that every restaurant in the world does it. Uh, it takes almost no time for preparation time. The rest is unattended baking and cooling time, which is the same with that. You don't have to put a lot of attention to this stuff in a busy day. Put a package of, which is 15 and a half ounces of graham crackers and two tablespoons of dark sugar uh, and a half a cup brown sugar and a half a cup of melted butter. Here it is on this little ledge in that cute I bolted that in the microwave. In a food processor, 
process it till it's really fine crumbs. If you don't have a food processor, crush them in a plastic bag with a rolling pin or buy them, you know, and then combine them thoroughly with the brown sugar after that. Okay, now let me go ahead. I have to move real fast on this now. Um, next thing that you want to do, you have to combine, you have to press your buttered crumbs into the bottom of a baking sheet and you bake them at 350 degrees for 10 minutes, something like that. You want to be sure to use a springform pan, even though I just said baking sheet. Use a 300, um, use a nine inch springform pan, something, and put it on a baking sheet because you want to be sure in case it drips and drabs into your oven that you won't have to clean it. Now, set them in the oven. Take it out of the oven, then in a large mixing bowl or a food processor, go ahead and beat three eight-ounce packages of cream cheese until it's smooth and fluffy. And then slowly beat, it, beat in a half a cup of dark brown sugar. Oh, that's not going to pour. It's... And then beat four eggs and one teaspoon of vanilla and beat them in and you do it one at a time but I kind of have a time deadline close your eyes do it one at a time and a teaspoon of vanilla now what I've got over here are some heath bits and it turns out that heath bits are seasonal now, you can use any of your particular favorite candy that you want to, but these are just broken up Heath candy bars, but you can use whatever kind you want to. They don't pay me a thing. Whir it all together very quickly. You don't want to over chop those Heath bars. Pour it in, put it into your dish, bake the whole thing in the middle of the oven until it's set about 50 to 60 minutes. This is all you have to do to this. Cool it in the pan on a wire rack and remove the sides. Let me show you that very quickly. This is so good. You know, I'm a, I've got a couple of junk things that I really like, and Heath bars are one of them. Okay, here we go. Do this. Just snap off the end. There you are. It's really good. Keep it refrigerated, and it'll freeze, too. The bottom gets a little gummy, but I still like it. Natalie will be right back after this information. The rich, fertile soil and mild climate of South Texas give rise to a variety of onions second to none. These particularly mild sweet onions are known by the trade name Texas Spring Sweet Onions. The Texas Spring Sweet Onion and the Texas 1015 Super Sweet Onion which is one of the newest, sweetest, and mildest onion varieties in the spring sweet family, are a big crop in the Lone Star State. They bring in about $60 million in annual sales from around 14,000 acres. Texas spring sweet onions are planted in the fall, beginning in the semi-tropical Rio Grande Valley at the southern tip of Texas, up to the winter garden area southwest of San Antonio. These yellow grano, or round onions, are called short-day onions because they grow during the short days of winter. The winters in the Texas spring sweet onion growing area are mild and warm. So while much of the rest of the nation is shivering in the cold, this area stays green. In other words, South Texas is a great place to grow onions. When the onion bulbs are mature, their green tops die and fall over. The harvest then begins around March each year, making the Texas Spring Sweets the first freshly harvested onions to appear in the markets each spring. The harvesting extends into May. To harvest the onions, they are first bladed mechanically so they pop to the surface of the ground. By hand, skilled workers then go through the fields to clip them. That means cutting off the tops and the roots. The buckets of clipped onions are emptied into burlap bags, which sit in the fields for several days to cure or dry out in the warm sun and breezes typical of South Texas. At the right time, these bags are emptied on conveyor belts, loaded into trucks, and taken to packing sheds to be graded, sized, and packed. The Texas 1015 Super Sweet Onion, mentioned earlier, is affectionately called the Million Dollar Baby 
because its development took more than one million dollars from the South Texas onion industry and 10 years of research by Dr. Leonard Pike of Texas A&M University. Named for its optimum planting date of October 15th, the Texas 1015 Super Sweet somewhat revolutionized the onion industry. Dr. Pike found the chemical pyruvate to be the culprit that created both indigestion and the tearing effect when you cut into onions. From this discovery, he reduced the level of pyruvic acid in the hybrid 1015 to create the even milder onion. Just like the vast state of Texas, this onion likes to grow big and will sometimes reach a weight of a pound each. Harvested in mid-April, the Texas 1015 Super Sweet Onion is available through May. Onions have always been held in high esteem. President George Washington believed that the onion is the most favored food that grows. And poet Robert Louis Stevenson called the onion the poetic soul of a capacious salad bowl. And in the annals of folk remedies, onions have been given credit for curing or preventing a variety of woes, from hair loss, kidney stones, and itchy feet, to earache, scurvy, and insomnia. Doctors and researchers are now beginning to substantiate the medicinal powers of onions, and they've come up with some encouraging information. Onion consumption has been linked to a reduced risk of certain kinds of cancer in studies of both human populations and laboratory mice. For nearly a century, Le Creuset's colorful French cookware has been a favorite in kitchens around the world. From its bold finishes and uncompromised quality to its easy to clean materials, the brand's range of iconic products are as easy to use as they are to love. Country meatloaf is another make-ahead dish. I think maybe cold meatloaf is almost better than hot meatloaf. It's certainly very American, and this is very Cajun. That's very appropriate with our American garden China, I might add. Now, I really got hungry for meatloaf when I lived in England. Um, I was at the Cordon Bleu, and I was eating a lot of wonderful, wonderful food every night when I came home. But I missed meatloaf, and I would go over to my friend Barbara's house, and she would, had, had a big family, and she would sit, and she would make this meatloaf, and she would dump everything in with her hands and make it on the counter and shape it, and I just loved it. She free-formed hers, and I do that sometimes, too. So let me go ahead now. Now I have three kinds of meat in here, um, and in fact, part of the basis of this is what Paul Predhome calls the trinity of Cajun cooking, onions, garlic, and bell peppers. Uh, the Holy Trinity. So I think it's a, and it's a good use for leftover rice. I hope you make your rice ahead of time and uh, make more than what you need and then freeze what you don't eat and pull it out when you want it. Pop it in the microwave or just pop it and put it over boiling water. It saves you time. And that's the whole point of all this is to teach you how to save time. Your onion would have been chopped earlier when you were doing those other onions and so would have your garlic been peeled and chopped. I didn't show you how to... Um, to um, peel your garlic. Let me just show you how to do that real quick. Just give it a swack and peel it, chop it, same way you would an onion. Go into the root, across, and then down, and then work your knife back and forth. And of course, if you want to chop it, and this is a big onion. What size is an onion? It's kind of like what size is a loaf of bread. It just depends on the eye of the beholder and of the cook. Now I've got this peeled. If you want to chop it, you go into the root following the lines, like that. Then you go across. I just did do half of this. And then down. If you want to slice it, do it the same way, just like this. Pull your skin off. You know how many layers there are of dried skin tells you how long it's been since that onion was pulled in the field. If there's only one layer of brown, because 
when an onion is pulled, that's what the outside onion looks like. And then as it lies in the field, lays, lies, as it sits in the field, um, the onion skin turns brown around it. So that's how you can tell how old it is by how it starts to dehydrate down. If you want to slice it, go ahead and slice it like this. Okay, now go ahead, here's your red bell pepper. And this is probably pretty optional. You don't need this except if you want to have a Cajun meatloaf. And go ahead and cut out your little pith. Don't ever cut up in the air. And it's harder to slice it if you slice through the tough spot, the, the outside skin like that. But then on the other hand, it's hard to slice when it's wobbling. So if you want to slice it when it's wobbling, cut it like that and then slice down this way. And then to chop it, chop it across. Okay, now combine your ground beef, your ground pork, and some hot sausage. And then add your chopped onion, your chopped garlic, let me see where it is, your chopped garlic, some shredded carrot. This is kind of to appease the vegetarians that are writing me. Some chopped pepper, some chopped rice, a couple of eggs, whisk them up separately, and add them separately. Um, you just want to crack each egg separately so in case you wouldn't want to contaminate one with the other and never use an eggshell that's cracked and you don't know where it came from. Some ketchup right here. If an egg is cracked, just throw it away. Not worth it. Ketchup, Dijon mustard. Horseradish, where's my little horseradish? Is that it? No, it's a lot of garlic. Maybe I used the horseradish already. Horseradish, it kind of looks all the same here. That's just to taste. Then breadcrumbs. And I've got everything measured out here on a plate. Chili powder, paprika, mustard seeds, ground cumin, one of my favorites, fennel seeds, cayenne pepper. Add it all there. And then you want a drop of Tabasco and salt and pepper to taste. Okay. Now mix it all together with your hands. There's no other way to do it. Shape it and put it into a loaf pan. And let's talk about a loaf pan. First of all, it should be greased. We're doing this in a glass loaf pan, and don't make the mistake that we did. Um, along the line somewhere, we just grabbed a bread loaf pan and put it in there, and it all turned and, and was not correct for baking meat in. So don't assume that every loaf pan is, is good for, for making um, bread in, but particularly I mean meatloaf in, but particularly with all this um, acid on the topping here, it just turned and everything. Get yours a little bit better mixed. Okay, go ahead there, put it in there, top it with some baking strips, ta-da, bake it at 375 degrees for 30 minutes, and I've got another one here, miraculously, that has come out, and be sure, don't forget, to bake it on a baking sheet because you don't want to have it drip all over your stove. Then while it's baking, mix together some ketchup and some beef stock, and that's canned beef stock, just like the chicken stock earlier. And then after 30 minutes, pour it over the meat. This just keeps it nice and moist. And of course, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that with your fingers. Bake it another 30 to 40 minutes longer. Let it cool in the pan about 10 minutes before slicing and then serve it hot or refrigerate it up to 10 days. It's very good. Double the recipe and freeze one of the loaves for later. It just doesn't take much more time to do two rather than one, so, so do that if you will. Take your immaculately clean hands and very quickly just make cucumbers and radishes with yogurt dip. I'm gonna go over this very, very quickly. Here's some yogurt cheese. I just threw yogurt in here, whatever fat content you want, into a cheesecloth or colander. Suspend it over a bowl or I have a pie plate here. Drain the excess liquid from it. Uh, then go ahead and take um, your yogurt, some sour cream, yogurt cheese, your sour cream, your ground cumin, 
ground coriander, chopped mint, and salt and pepper to taste. Whisk it until it's well combined. Chill it at least one to two hours, preferably overnight. The longer, in fact, several days, this makes it even better. Score your cucumbers, trim them into one and one fourth inch slices, something that you want to eat on. Trim your radishes, put it into a dip, and serve with the cucumbers and radishes for dipping. It's pretty pretty. It's as colorful as the American flag. A savory meatloaf is one dish you can be sure will please. Natalie's Cajun Country Meatloaf was the spicy highlight of today's menu. Light and luscious cucumbers and radishes with yogurt dip. A savory baked onion soup casserole and Heath Bar cheesecake were other featured attractions in this episode of Natalie Dupree Cooks.